Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for premium picks. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me take a moment to wipe the egg off my face and to try to get this taste of crow out of my mouth. I took a loss on the Richard Abril Sharif Bogare fight that took place on Saturday night. I had the underdog Sharif Bogare. Um, you got between a plus 160 and greater than 2 to 1 odds taking the underdog. If you're like me, you also got a loss doing so. What made Bogare an interesting underdog? Let's go through it. Just want you to know my thinking as I make this video. Okay, uh, first of all, Bogare not only went the distance in the fight, right? This fight went the distance. But Bogare, because he was the more active fighter, actually threw 181 more punches than Richard Abril. Right? He's not just more active, he's more active by a third. Right? A lot more punches thrown by Bogare. The other uh, factor that showed itself in this fight was that Bogare started fast. I believe most of the people watching this video at the end of three rounds had Bogare ahead in the fight. Whether you had it 2 1 Bogare or 3 0 Bogare, Bogare started fast. So, what could possibly have gone wrong? that led literally two of the three judges to give nine rounds of the fight to Richard Abril. And that would lead the Showtime cast. And keep in mind, that cast included some esteemed people. Former referee Joe Cortez, right? Current champion Pauli Malinaji, boxing guru Al Bernstein. They all had Richard Abril winning the fight comfortably by several rounds, four, five, six rounds, right? What happened? Because Bogare is the more active fighter. He's going the distance, right? He starts fast. What could possibly have happened? Let me go further. Richard Abril had such a problem dealing with something I mentioned in the pre-fight video, the jump in. Bogare's ability to jump in. He had such a problem with it that he started to excessively hold Bogare to the point where the referee even deducted a, re a point from Richard Abril. Here's where I feel Bogare gave away the fight. And let me just point out too. Sour grapes on my part, right? I have a lot of taste in my mouth. Crow and sour grapes. Try that combination. Sour grapes, I'm a bit surprised at the scoring, right? To me, this is a very close fight. As you read the media reports, if you're reading about how it was a hard-to-score fight and how it was a rough-and-tumble fight, I don't understand how anyone could have Richard Abril winning this fight by five or six rounds. I just don't see it, folks, okay? But admittedly, I saw the fight through biased eyes. But um, Bogare did make some mistakes. I believe it cost him the fight. Case in point, after Abril gets warned for excessive holding by referee Russell Moore, who I thought did a good job, right? And let me just say, Moore did deduct a point from Bogare for leading with his head later in the fight. So the point deductions neutralized. But when Bogare jumps in, especially after Abril is penalized. When Bogare jumps in and Abril is trying to tie him up and doesn't know what to do because he doesn't want to hold Bogare, that's when Bogare, quite frankly, should have 
let his hands go to a bruised body. Let me go one step further. If you look at old films of Mike McCallum, the body snatcher, great fighter from the 1980s, right? You're going to see that one of the things that made Mike McCallum great was the fact that Mike McCallum made it hard for you to grab him. In other words, McCallum, again, whose nickname was the body snatcher. So he's inside ripping up your rib cage, right? He's not a long range guy. He's literally ripping up your rib cage. That's part of his game. When you went to grab McCallum, McCallum would knock your hands down. Now here, you had a dynamic of a very tall champ who likes to fight from distance behind a jab, right? You know, very tall, very lanky, prefers to operate from distance. My point to you is simply, you know, when Bogare jumps in, especially in the second half of the fight, when the fight slipped away from him, and when Abril comes forward, right, to try to grab Bogare without grabbing him. There are times where Abril literally leans on Bogare and has his hands apart because he doesn't want to get penalized a second point. Bogare at that point should have kept throwing punches and should have moved away. The point is, you don't want to fight the fight that Brandon Rios fought against Richard Abril. You don't want the fight to come down to skirmishes and then breaks. You want a non-stop skirmish, especially when you're the one who's the more active fighter getting on the inside, right? If you're inside and the guy's trying to hold you, you should knock his hands down or duck out of that, get behind him, keep the action going. Instead, Bogare would jump inside. Bogare was not accurate, right? Richard Abril landed a higher percentage of his punches than Bogare, right? Bogare would jump inside, throw punches mainly up top, not a lot to the body, and then allow Abril to tie him up. Quite frankly, I was disappointed with Bogare the second half of the fight, right? One of the reasons, of course, is I was losing my money. But the other reason is just that the opportunity was there and he let it slip away. Let's also get a little advanced here. Boxing's a dirty business, right? If I'm going to hit a guy and try to knock him out, there are a few places that are perfect for that. We'll call them tender spots. The temple, the chin, right? The liver. These are places that are known to stop a guy. Solar plexus. If I'm outside and I'm going to leap in head first, why would I leap in and have my head hit the guy here in the forehead? Right? Abril got cut because of Sharif Bogare leaping in. I agree with Joe Cortez. I believe it was unintentional, but we all know you can be reckless, right? I don't have to intend to hit you with my head. I just have to recklessly jump in. So there's a high probability that I'm going to do just that. Why would I, with my head, aim for your forehead when if I just duck a little bit lower, given that I'm the shorter man already, I could come in and hit you with my head on your chin, right? All I'm saying is it's harder to detect a headbutt and you could do significant damage with a headbutt. If you headbutt a guy around the chin area, even the throat area, as opposed to up here in the head area, right? I understand that up here you're creating cuts that might bleed into the eye. I saw that happening to Richard Abril. Okay, fine. But all I'm saying is, if you're a headbutt guy, you can't be that obvious. Right? I thought 
Bogare was being a bit obvious. Here I was rooting for Bogare, and even I, early in the fight, saw Bogare coming in recklessly with his head and thought something here wasn't quite right. Right? Bogare has to, dare I say it, watch more films of Bernard Hopkins and guys like that and figure out how to duck his head, leap in. Have the other guy concerned that his head's going to hit him in the mouth and around the chin area, which is devastating, but isn't as obvious to a referee. Let me just point out, too, this was a high-level match. If you look at the call that Russell Moore made when he deducted the point from Richard Abril, you're going to see that Abril's a slick customer because Bogare is in. Moore is over here. Abril, of course, isn't holding Bogare on this side. He has his hand locked on Bogare away from the referee. Now, Moore, to his credit, saw it. It was clearly holding, right? I believe Paulie Malignaggi, who had a great night, saw it on the telecast and said, well, he had to do something, meaning the referee had to make a call at that point given the prior warnings. But my point to you is simply this, and I know it's a side of the sport we don't want to talk about, but, you know, skillful boxers know how to do things away from the referee. And skillful boxers know how to do things without looking obvious. Sharif Bogare, I thought, actually had an advantage because of his shorter height. I thought he would come in lower. If he's going to come in and make his head an issue, he shouldn't have made his head an issue where he's leaping in and hitting the guy here. He should have come in a little bit lower. Angles are everything in boxing. Let me also say this too. I underestimated Richard Abril or Richard Abril. Right, I guess he's changed his name. He's dropped the D from the Richard. Right? I'll say this. I was very impressed. Very impressed by how with the bullets flying, with a guy coming in and headbutting him multiple times, with a cut that was bleeding and another head injury off of headbutts, with an opponent who was off to a fast start. I was very impressed with how Richard Abril just keeps his temperament even. No panic. Didn't get dragged into some kind of emotional fight. This guy is a mathematician, right? There's certain things he wanted to do. He wasn't going to let a few headbutts a referee deduction and some cuts and a fast start by his opponent mess up his mental game. Right? Richard Abril is very strong mentally. He had a game plan. He wasn't going to deviate from it. Not even the opponent's greater volume was going to get him off that. I also underestimated just how accurate Richard Abril is with his punches and his timing, right? Sharif Bogare keeps jumping in. And Richard Abril, by the end of the fight, has him timed, where he's hitting him with crisp counters, right? Literally catching Sharif Bogare on the way in. Let me just point out, too, that that's another problem I had with Sharif Bogare. You know my theory on boxing. The guys at the top are hard to find in the ring. They're not obvious. You can't predict their next move. All I'm saying is this. If you're spending the fight jumping in continually and the other guy figures out that you're jumping in, then you need to do something else. Fake like you're jumping in. Do feints. Right? Change the cadence, change the rhythm of the fight, come out in a round with a different strategy. If the other guy has figured out that you're always on your front foot, you need to be on your back foot 
for a round, right? I thought Sharif Bogare, first championship fight, didn't keep his head together, didn't keep his game together in the last six rounds. All of that said, let me just say, this fight was much closer than it was scored. And I'll say this, if I'm going to take an underdog in a fight, it's going to be an underdog like Sharif Bogare, who goes the distance and outthrows his opponent. Abril outlanded him, much more accurate, but at least Sharif was in the fight fighting and being accurate. Let me add a few words on Gary Russell. You know, I learn a lot here online, and I once made a video where I was talking about Manny Pacquiao, and I mentioned that Pacquiao had among the fastest hands in boxing. I believe at the time I mentioned uh, Yvonne Calderon, a lighter champion who also had incredibly fast hands to me. A reader, I wish I remember who you were, a subscriber, uh, then posted a message saying, Dwyer, you need to look at Gary Russell, right? I pulled up the tapes of Gary Russell that I could find. This was a while ago. And Gary Russell indeed had blinding hands. Let me say this. Gary Russell was on the undercard of Abril Bogare, right? You've heard me here online coin a phrase, right? I'll say, you know, that guy is a mid-range hooker. Right, meaning that the guy stands about arm's length from you and he's throwing predominantly hooks. Well, Gary Russell, quite frankly, let's coin a new phrase, is a mid range jabber. Right, he has blinding hand speed. In my opinion, he squanders some of it and he won every round in his fight. Right? He won every round in his fight, but he squanders some of the hand speed by being right in front of you. His game is just to outthink you, he's very creative, and to outbox you from up close. I believe that he would have more effective hand speed if you didn't know he was right in front of you. Right, I believe Manny Pacquiao, prime Pacquiao, and let me just say this, and I don't say it lightly, Pacquiao's past his prime now. If you haven't figured it out, then you haven't been noticing the flush punches Pacquiao's been getting hit with. Let me also say that because Pacquiao, right, like Roy Jones, relied a lot on athleticism in the ring, more than technique, Let's hope he doesn't end up sliding like Roy Jones has in his late career, right? But let me say this, prime Pacquiao, and by prime Pacquiao, I'm talking about the Pacquiao who fought Oscar De La Hoya, right? In my opinion, that's prime Pacquiao. Understand, Pacquiao's all over the ring. He's not right in front of you, right? I believe that a guy who moves has even faster hand speed. Because I don't even know when that guy's going to touch me. In other words, if you're right in front of me, if you're Gary Russell, well, especially when you're jab heavy like Gary Russell is, I know I'm going to be dealing with the jab, then I'm going to be dealing with quick counters. Right? I already know that. With Manny Pacquiao, it's almost like being in a dark haunted house. Right? You're there. It's dark. Something's moving. Whap! You know what I mean? Then, of course, you turn around, you're getting hit with a combination, right? You didn't even know when that first punch was coming, right? Oscar De La Hoya doesn't even have the opportunity that Gary Russell's opponent on Saturday night had. That opponent could stand in the middle of the ring with Gary Russell and actually trade with him a bit. Oscar De La Hoya gets so shocked by Manny Pacquiao that toward the end of that fight, De La Hoya is just leaning on the ropes, getting hit, right? He's fighting a ghost. He doesn't even know when the blinding hand speed's going to come. You know, Manny Pacquiao is back. Then he just touches you a little with the right hand, a right jab, then pap! You know, he's hitting you, right? So all I'm saying is this, too. When you're a Gary Russell, 
and you have blinding hand speed, but you're right in front of the guy, right? You're vulnerable to a guy like Thomas Hearns. In other words, if there's a tall guy who can come over your reach, right? Think about it. Richard Abril, for example, is 5'9", and he weighs 135, right? If there's a tall guy who can come over your reach and hit you, you're going to be in trouble, right? Because he'll be able to hit you. You won't be able to hit him. So I'm very impressed with Gary Russell, but I'll say this. He hasn't married the hand speed to his foot speed, right? You know, the Ray Leonards of the world, the Manny Pacquiao's, they move around the ring. So when they come visit you with a combination, you might be prepared, you might not be prepared. To me, that's harder to deal with than a guy who you know is at your front door throwing a combination, right? So just first impression, well, not first impression, but just ongoing impression uh, with Gary Russell, especially since Gary Russell at this stage, after having been brought along way too slow, right, way too slow, uh, Gary Russell apparently now is ready to fight the big names. You need to know who he is. You need to try to picture in your mind ways he can win and ways, quite frankly, his opponents can win, right? I think Gary uh, Russell's um, tendency to stay in front of you is a problem, as, of course, are his tender hands, which Al Bernstein mentioned during the telecast. Let me know what you think. Leave your comments for me here online. Let me just say this, too. This is not the last fight, the Bogare Abril fight, that I'm going to lose. Unfortunately, when you gamble, you're going to have losses. That comes with the territory. So, you know, really, with a fight like this, I can't say I have any regrets on picking a guy who's an underdog, who went the distance, and who out threw the champ by more than 100, um, you know, punches. I will say, though, that, you know... What can you say when you're picking a guy who's going up against a champ and it's his first title fight, there's risk involved. That risk came back and hurt me on this one. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com and dwyervip.com. Thanks for stopping by.